do it a little different because I'm delving a little bit more behind the scenes tonight. As much as he is an artist and a producer, a songwriter, he's also been, uh, it's hard to even put into words, he's been the man behind one of the most legendary UK labels of all time, signing the likes of Dizzy Rascal, MIA, Adele, Giggs, FKA, Twigs, Prodigy, the list just goes on. Tonight, we go in depth with the man they call Richard Russell. How are you doing, Rich? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good, man. We, we spoke just as you entered the room. We're like, it's been a minute. We, we were planning to do this almost a year ago. So it's great that we've got around to doing it. I feel like the timing's even better now. Yeah, I was th just thinking about that. I think, was that when we were just putting out the first bit of music from this, from everything's recorded, yeah, right? Yeah, that's it was, right. It was then. That's right. Yeah, you, you just, you'd announced you were doing the project. Yeah. We just had, you know, first couple of tracks I was supporting on the radio. I was like, you know what? Richard uh, and everything that he's done and is doing and continues to do, it makes perfect sense for these in-depths because we know that sometimes the story and the history and how people get to where they are sometimes goes amiss. So I like to kind of sit down and just put everything into context. So if you don't mind, I'd like to take things back a little bit. Before we talk about the current and the future, if we could take things back just a little bit. It's your show, your house. <laughs> so Rich, uh, for those that don't know, You've headed up and uh, and been a part of and founded the legendary label XO Recordings, which has provided us with some of the most legendary music the UK's had to offer over the past, what, 20, almost 30 years now? Mm. It's, it's all flashing before my eyes. <laughs> what flashes up first when I say that? I don't know. I mean, it's... it's I mean, I don't want to get too deep, too yeah, quick. Yeah, yeah. But I do think time, it's a bit, sometimes I think it's a bit illusory. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, yeah. We've got our way of understanding it. Yeah. We yeah. have to have some way of understanding <laughs> it. But then some things that, that happened, it turns out it's a long time ago, seem quite recent, yeah. you know? And some yeah, stuff. Most definitely. And some stuff, particularly of that rave era, is just erased. Yeah. It just feels like so <laughs> so long gone. ago. <laughs> it's just gone. I guess so, I guess it would be good to, to kind of to, to to put it out there that the kind of story that I guess drew you to music in the first place. Because growing up, listening to music and, and loving music, what was your what was your early inspirations? What drew you to 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 your passion for music? Like I think, like everyone, you know, I think that the era I grew up in of music was like this great magical era, but. I've come to realise they're all great magical mm. eras. Do you know what I mean? Feel there's been some magic in, in all of them. In all of them, yeah. exactly. There's like that thread, isn't there, of just of just that something magical going on. And if you're 13, 14, 15, and you're and you're going to end up being that music guy, and you get into music at that like that deep connection you get at that age, it's mm. incredible, isn't it? And yeah. it's I also think people are always discovering some old stuff of that moment alongside what's like current yeah. and popping right then yeah. so yeah, I think you're always getting this there's kind of always an overlap yeah always a mixture because also you've got like what your mum like, might be listening to so yeah. there's always that kind of uh, there's that like, narrative of music which is older music so you know the 80s was my growing up time and so I listened to I, I mean I was listening to everything I was listening to a lot of 80s soul was a big thing for me um, there were a couple of radio shows that I used to listen to so that definitely had like a that had a magical place for me. And also, and now, of course, now I realise what was interesting about that period, and you're not going to be thinking this as a teenager, but it was like that soul music had a lot of electronic mm. aspects to yeah. it. So whereas in the 70s, the soul music was live. Yeah. In the 80s, the drum machines were in there together with live instrumentation. So you were hearing quite an interesting sort of glimpse of the future, like of what we've got now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was really like happening then. So that was, and then, and hip hop, you know, so hip hop and music based on sampling. So that was when I was like 15, you know, it just got me. I just, mm. I just got it. And it was, I think, you know, it's interesting. People had this experience with hip hop that, you know, it was all music from New York pretty much at that yeah. moment, which, and that now seems pretty wild. Yeah. But it was all <laughs> coming yeah. from New York. Crazy. But it was like a local New York music. It seems, it seems wild now, but it was all coming from New York and, you know, from, but but there were people like not not the masses of people like in my school there were three kids in my year who liked hip hop yeah and of course now <laughs> It'd be every, great, kid, yeah. every kid every kid yeah pretty yeah. much because yeah. it's because it's, it's it's just music now but then it was something different but if you felt it I just think you could feel that connection mm. to it you know you didn't have to be in the Bronx it was like you you had that that connection to it and it just said something to you and I think people who who got into hip hop at that stage in some ways I think we knew. It was going to take over the world mm. because it was just so exciting. It yeah. was so mind blowing. But but at that point, not everyone could see that. Early on, man, that's I goes. I guess those those early inspirations and 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 discovering the likes of 
hip hop alongside artists such as Prince and, and everything that was going on and, and flourishing in the eighties kind of brought you to the position where you were about to 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 to, to have a career in music. Yeah, I mean, I was um, the Prince was one. Of, I think that I, I chose a Prince song for us to, to listen to. Right? Yeah, I, I, one of my favorites as well, actually. And, and one of the reasons I chose that was because the first time I ever went in a recording studio was. Um, you know, do you know the Tabernacle in Labrador? I do, yeah, Paris yeah, Square? yeah. So they used to have a little studio in the back there, and I knew the guy who was the engineer was a guy called Johnny Coleman, and I was I was living around there from when from when I was a teenager, and I and I just knew him. He was just about, and he, we talked about the studio, and I said, oh, I've got some records. I want to like, I want to make some like tunes, yeah, like sample based tunes, and um, I made one with uh, with Prince. I want to be your lover, wow. which I thought was like. When it was done, I was like, oh, "Best thing ever." <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I've done it. Oh, that's it. That's I'm it. done. <laughs> and, uh, it was, and it turned out it wasn't quite that beginner's luck. <laughs> but actually, that was. It's a weird thing. I took that tune to what was actually, what was XL. Wow. Just just started as like, and I, as a DJ, I was playing the first couple of tunes on it, and I thought, "Are oh, they?" I'll do an EP for yeah, them. Yeah. <laughs> it's a no-brainer. <laughs> and um, I played the tune to Nick Hawks, who was like the guy there, and he was like, hey, you should play me this when it's finished. And I was thinking, what? But it is, by like, it, <laughs> it is finished. <laughs> and, he was, and he was right, because I'm sure I just looped it, and I thought, yeah, this is, you know, sometimes you get something yeah, going yeah, in the yeah. tune, you're like, this, this is it. Happen, yeah. like, it happens to me all the time. Like, I, I know that exact feeling, like, yeah, it's done, it's finished, it's, and then someone's like, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, this is this is where the... um. Fee, you know, this is something I've in, increasingly over the years I've, I've realised that like, everything is collaborative, right? And it's in collaboration that you get the power in things. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like you got to have your focus and you got to have your beliefs. Like I got strong beliefs about what I'm meant to be doing, but I'm also a big believer in collaboration and the energy, just the energy of other people. You know, you can play a tune that you thought was one thing to another person. Mm. They don't have to say a word. A lot of the time, it's just the energy yeah. of that other person. You know, everyone's a ball of energy, and you you suddenly realise, ah, oh, right, yeah. yeah, it's it's yeah. it's not this, it's, it's that. that, yeah. And um, so I think that kind of and I think there's almost like a myth as well of like people think, um, recording artists are kind of like stuff happens and it's fully formed and it, people know what they're doing and they're you know, but really, often it's 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 an accident. It's 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 a. Uh, uh, a happy mistake sometimes it, it, it's a whole range of uh, things that can come up with a, a great record but this would be a great time to press play on that Prince record go on let's do it go on he says Richard Russell's in the building for tonight in depth 1989 yeah yeah so that that early so I've been I'd started going out in London um, and the the, the the early like nightlife for me was I said again like everyone thinks when they start going out is the greatest. That was particularly good though, because obviously now nightlife's not, you, we're in a different spot for yeah, nightlife right yeah, now. Yeah. It's like a perfect storm of like the internet licensing, gentrification. Yeah. It's tricky, right? Yeah. We know it's like, it's a, especially in London, it's a, it's a funny moment, right? Um, but then it was like, you know, it was pretty lawless, mm. you know? And, and also what was going on musically was like the, the sound systems that were like, so, you know, you'd had reggae sound systems, but when I started going out, there was like the sounds, the, the soul to soul, family function, shaking, ping a pop, finger pop, these sound systems. And a lot of DJs who are, st you know, Norman Jay and a lot of people who are still important figures now. Um, but I was getting to really like, I, I just like a 15 year old, I was getting to hear music from them, le really learn about music. And I think the fact that like people were playing hip hop and what they used to call rare groove, meaning just old soul records, yeah, yeah. that was like, I was thinking like, that was really lucky because that was I mean super educational, but like so it was old music being played as new music, yeah, in a way, and <laughs> yeah. it was new to yeah. me, yeah. So, so it's that's, like it, it's depending on what era you were from. It was like you hearing it for the first time, or you hearing it as a kind of it's been kind of done the whole rounds and come back around as like revolution or whatever. Yeah, so so you yeah, so you're hearing like a hip hop record that Marley Marlis produced, but you're also hearing the James Brown record that he sampled. So it's pretty like it's like being presented in quite a yeah, just just a really good way, mm. and that's how I first heard. You know, Girls Got Heron was as a, it's a rare groove song. You know, it's a song. It's seventies music being played in the eighties. So yeah, that era of going out. Then there's like acid house creeping in, um, and so that's a whole nother kind of excitement. And then there's these big raves of biology and sunrise, which I was going to, and I was DJing. We I, 
me and my friends had a sound system, but we were like, it was it was not the best. <laughs> it just wasn't the best. I mean, I realised now the intention was good though. Yeah. The idea of it was yeah. good. But in a way, we, you know, we were looking at like, you know, soul to soul family function. We were looking at these things like a group of kids with guitars in their garage look at the Rolling Stones. Yeah. That's what it was like. Yeah. And you don't sound like the Rolling Stones. <laughs> yeah. but, but, you know... The intention was there. The intention the, was yeah. good, yeah. And the, and the music was... It was called Housequake. And the music was good in the, in the, the tunes we had. But, you know, it was, the, it was the right idea. So I was doing that. I was going out. Acid House. Re- trying to make hip-hop records. No one really interested. Raves creeping in. And then as soon as, like, rave is creeping in... So with rave, you've got, like... All these influences, there's big reggae influence in it, mm. for one thing. It's like yeah. the sound system, yeah. the bass is in there. There's the hip-hop influence in there. And then you've got this kind of more like noisy, aggro, European synthesized thing. And the way we used to make records was just quick. Mm. Quick for DJing with. Yeah. And no one even used to use the word artist. Yeah. Like that would have been pretentious. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was yeah. like tunes, yeah. making tunes, tunes yeah. DJing with them. And it was so... And, and a lot of people were like producer um, or artist, DJ, label, mm. that culture. Yeah. It's still the culture, right? Yeah. You've got a label, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You've got a label, yeah, DJ, producer, this is what, like, it's just, just, just the culture. Yeah, it just ends up being what you do, yeah. And it, and these things, I think, they they feed each other really well. Yeah. Because as long as you've got that sort of central musical effect and you're not getting stretched too far in one direction or another, um, those things just feed each other great. So I think we had this we had this early phase with the label when it was a XL was a rave label and the silver and black sleeves that it was just so simple and it wasn't it was unconsidered you know what I mean mm. it was I mean I realise now the model for that in a way was like what the reggae labels used to do is like I mean, we were basically buying dats pretty yeah. much yeah yeah you know and um, pressing them up and putting them out and you but the thing that was what was interesting was that it was like an underground movement it was like a people's movement it wasn't on the radio it was nothing like you know we didn't have this yeah this was this. I mean, this would have been everyone's wildest dream, yeah. really. I remember coming across, like early, you know, for me, early UK rave music, and the first rave music that I really liked was was hearing tracks like SL2, Prodigies, um, Out of Space. Those records I gravitated towards, and I remember seeing the, like you said, the black and silver XL sleeves, and thinking, I don't know who these guys are, but I like what they're doing here. Yeah, I, I, I've, I found out that both the two records that I really liked were from the same label and that I found really interesting. But we were all like frustrated B-boys into reggae, into hip-hop mm. and not, not really with a way of making that kind mm. of music. Not really with like access to great vocalists and just like... So this was like us trying to make a noise that somehow got close to that. I mean, we never thought our records were as good as the hip-hop records at the time or the reggae records. Yeah. We never thought what we were... We were a bit like... Oh, we, but, but actually because there was like the spirit of it was good and it was like I don't know maybe a little bit because we were a bit reluctant or something mm. it was we were quite like we were very nonchalant about it really and I, 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 again I don't think anybody really knew what they had and no. where we were going with it or where you know what you guys were really doing back then that was going to have such an impact 20, yeah. 25 years later definitely but then but then equally but it wasn't even like not even that that much later like I think when the grime thing was just kicking off and when like Wiley and Dizzy were pressing up the wall, just listen you you, you you were right there you were in the centre of it I was on the edges of it but when I saw what was going on I was like oh well, this is just that again yeah. they're doing they're doing what yeah they're, but but they're vocalists yeah. as well and it was like okay this is big that was, that felt, was where it had this a, felt the something different and of course the vocal the MCs were always part of it but it was MCs for live mm. in the rave thing. It wasn't really MCs for records, yeah. you know. So I suppose the, and then and then as the garage thing kicked off, you, you were in like that that transition, weren't was, you? Because yeah, the MCs uh, are kind of caught between, like you said, MC and as a host for live, and then as that like our generation came through and the likes of Wileys, the Dizzies, it was the lyrics were more about what was going on in the estate, or you know, like you said, becoming more of an artist for record. So when I, I, I mean, when I heard. Like when I heard that I love you white label, when I when I heard that start, I was literally like, thank God. Like I just thought this has been such a long time coming. Yeah. You know, it really and obviously they were of course they were like leaning on stuff that came before them and of garage course, and yeah, that scene. Yeah. Not to not to say that scene wasn't massively important, of course it was. Um but when that started and also Wiley, I really felt like was to me was like 
a genius, it almost in like, like I imagine the jazz geniuses used to be. Mm. Like where you're just miles ahead. Yeah. Like you're so far ahead of yeah. what other people yeah. are doing. Like he literally that, was though as well. Yeah, yeah. So it was like, I think to a lot of people, it was probably quite confusing. Mm. Like, what is this sound? What's yeah. this noise? Like, what is it? And you, and of course, you listen to those Wiley tunes now, just the minimal, I mean, it's incredible, yeah. isn't it? And, and they still and drop. They, but, they, they still go off. And, and what's great to see as well in 2018 is that a lot of the new age grime artists, producers, DJs, MCs, they're they're referencing that early sound. So it's it's like you said, it's it's background again. I'd love to play a Wiley or a Dizzy Rascal record. In fact, um, I've drawn out a, a Dizzy Rascal record, one of my favourite from from Boy in the Corner, which mm. is still one of the most seminal grime albums. Mm. Signing both of those to XL must have been a pretty legendary moment. I think it was obvious to us like these guys are incredible. Mm. Um, and what's going on here is like, it's wild. But I think in ways that are maybe less clear now, that was not a widely held opinion. Because yeah. they were so ahead. It, it was so early. They were so ahead. It was so early. So they weren't like going to, you know, people people didn't believe. Mm. People didn't believe in, in those guys early on in, in the wider world. No, and in fact, not. in a way, even in the scene where they came from, a lot of people were like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, put, like, like, <laughs> you know, like right? even being there, like this, the, the XL, they're 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 really putting their their arm out and leg out and and really taking a risk here because, like you said, it wasn't, it was a really niche underground, almost cult thing at the time, and it, it had no mainstream legs or anything like that at no, the time. But, but that is, that's overrated. Mm. That thing, you know, that idea, mm. that idea of, um, what people are going to understand. Like, like, I do think like. If you put something, if you make something and put it out and you really believe in it and people are confused, that tends to be a really good sign. Mm. Like if people understand it too quickly, then maybe it's too simple mm. or maybe it's like just following what else is going on. It's Wednesday night. It's DJ Target in depth tonight with Richard Russell and we're really just breaking it down, man. Some of those, those, those signings to the legendary label XL. Like, I don't know if people really sit back at home and, and, and take on board the diversity how like how you guys really like you said at a time when Wiley and Dizzy was was just coming through and, and doing their thing and, and going and getting involved in the grime scene and, and pushing that and you know in a similar way that you did with the rave scene earlier you went on to sign the likes of MIA and a humongous pop star Adele and like the 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 roster has always been so diverse. As a label, as a as an A and R, as a as a boss, how do you go about seeking out potential artists? What is it that 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 they have to have? Is there a a, a specific something that has to stand out? I just don't really, you know. I just don't really seek seek things out. And I, I just because there's like there's an endless amount of people doing brilliant things out there. Yeah. You know, there really are so many people making interesting music so I've always taken this slightly like fatalistic approach like you're going to end up I mean I always saw this from a, very much from producer's point of view you're going to end up doing what you're going to end up doing do you know what I mean yeah. and I think that's probably very different for like the really big companies they're like trying to be like we've got to be on this we've got to do it but that's just not it's much smaller than the, the, the label's always been much smaller than that so it's like you're going to end up doing what you're going to end up doing and you're going to kind of I don't know, you're going to cross paths with people and you're going to want to do stuff together. Or you're not. Yeah. Did you know what I mean? Yeah. And it, it's like... It's, it's a great ethos to have because like you said, in in the world of of especially major labels, it's, it's all about numbers. It's, we have to hit this quote, we need to release this amount, market share. Like there's a lot of politics, if you like, that goes into the reasons why artists sign... I mean, labels sign artists and it, it, it looks from the outside that XL has always just kind of let things flow and we're going to do things because we really want it. I mean, there's always there's always been like drive in it, not to make out that it's been like so laid back. There's obviously always been like a drive to the whole thing mm. of like wanting it to be great and wanting to do things that are like count and, and mean something. But I just think there's a lot, there is a lot more kind of chance to these things than, than people might think, mm. you know? But, what what affects the chance is like what's the spirit of it mm. like what's the what's the intention and what's the spirit you're putting it's the same in the music making isn't it it's like if the intention is to do something good and to try and like push things a bit then you've got a chance of that happening and exactly how that happens or who it happens with 
You don't know. Mm. You know what I mean? You because we don't know where we're going to be a year from now. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You don't know what you don't really know what you're going to be doing. Who you're going to have met by chance on the way. It's very true. One night they will be bumping into this person and you have this conversation and you know and you're working together and this becomes something that can completely like transform everything you're doing. Yeah. If you're open to that yeah. and if you think it's possible, and I think also people sometimes they just get in a bit of a rut. You know, the rut that's like the I read this thing that said the only difference between a rut and a grave is the is the depth. Wow. Right? <laughs> wow. So yeah. it's it's yeah. like so I think that's that's the thing, is like always staying open for that. MIA is a good example because she was like she was just doing something no one else was doing. Yeah. And she wasn't a musician particularly. She was more of a visual artist. Mm. And um I was really into that. I thought that's wicked. It reminded me a bit of Malcolm McLaren who made like one of the first really great British hip hop records. He yeah. was just no, he just wasn't, I mean, she's more of a musician than he was. He's no musician. He was, he was a manager mm. of a punk band with a clothes shop. He decided, <laughs> I'm making a hip hop I'm record. I'm going to make a hip hop record. And off he went. And then it's like, well, how does it sound? It sounded wicked. I said, like, all right, well then, there you go. There you go, there you yeah. have it. Yeah, so I, I think that kind of, that spirit, it's like what, you know, like that idea of do it yourself, the DIY kind of spirit. DIY was, you know, punk was before my time, but DIY was in punk, DIY was in, rave DIYs and grime and now it's like DIY world mm. that's what's wicked that's that's like. that's, that's the, the literally the in thing the, the 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 current trend if you like is to be DIY to be self sufficient well and because that's what the the world has like um that's how the world has, has sort of evolved mm. isn't it it's, it's it's such a big thing it's like the the you know the spirit of like what we were doing when we start doing the rave thing i'd see that like I just relate so much to what's going on now and I love it. It's like because no one's sitting around waiting for permission or to mm. be told, you know, you it's, can. You've got to get up and do it. You just, you just do it. I mean, there's literally nothing stopping you. And I think the the best people have always had that feeling mm. and that spirit anyway. Yeah. And like, you know, you talked about the diversity of the people that I've worked with along the way, but that that's the thread. It's that spirit of like, I'm doing this. Yeah. It's not really like what other people are doing. I'm doing it. Yeah. A and great example of, of that spirit and that continuing to just, just fight and, and, and stay focused on exactly what they are doing is is Giggs, mm -hmm. who is in 2018 having an amazing time. And I know you guys signed Giggs a few years back when things were a lot more difficult for Giggs as an artist, you know, with shows getting shut down, unable to really flourish as an artist from the label side. Well, how, how tough was that having this, you know, having an artist like Giggs who you know the potential, you know what he's capable of and not really being able to to really fulfil it all because of of everything else that was surrounding it? I think it, it to me it's consistent though. It's consistent with like if you're doing something interesting one way or another there's going to be some reasons you can't someone saying you can't mm. but he just had that like times a thousand yeah yeah, yeah. like and, and get it coming from like official sources yeah so that's a whole nother weird thing but in a way there's always some like resistance mm. if you're doing something good do you know what i mean yeah. and if you're doing something revolutionary then there's a lot Definitely of resi there's a lot of resistance do you know what i mean there's always going to be people Whoever it is, whether it's like the people around you grew up, whatever it is, just saying, nah, you know, just people doubting. Mm. And, um, you know, so he, like, he had, like, a extra level of that, but then he is an extra focused mm. person, mm. you know? And I'm sure, I, I'm sure a, someone with less genuine sort of inner strength that would have got in the way of what they were doing. But he was just like, he's very philosophical as well, isn't he, Giggs? He's yeah. deep, yeah. you know what I mean? So it's like, I think there's a deep inner sort of, it's like a spiritual core there where he's like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, do yeah. I'm doing this. I'm, and I'm going to see this through. And, the, you know, so this is this is happening, but I'm doing this. And he always just seemed to me to have that kind of philosophical sense of like mission and purpose. Mm. You know? And it definitely seems like the mission is, is being fulfilled, man. Yeah, it's, flour it's, it's flourishing, isn't it? Like it should be. And I think it's flourishing and I believe a lot of other, a lot of other people are flourishing off the back of it yeah of directly course. or indirectly 100% you know but he's definitely like he's just kicks some doors down 100% and and I think yeah off the off, off the I mean ev like everyone's influenced by things and then and then if they're good they influence other things mm. but you can really see now like he's he's really inspiring people isn't he mm. he's inspiring people in a broad way oh in a in a massive way and um he's like I think it's a lot of responsibility in a way but he's like 
he's got those he's got the shoulders for it. Mm. We haven't really touched on on this artist much, but it'd be silly for me not to, to mention a lady who is without a doubt the, the, the biggest artist in the world, or, or if not one of the biggest artists we've had in an entire generation, Adele. What's it been like working with, with an artist who, who just goes to, a, to a, a magnitude that we've not seen before? Obviously, a, a blessing, of course. And I think I think everyone who's been involved in it has felt like very, um, you know, just fortunate to be involved in something like that. Because it, I, I think there's a big difference with these things to what people imagine, which is that you don't, no, mm. you know, you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, I sometimes think she did know what was going to happen. <laughs> I have certain things I think about now, and I think in some ways more than more than you could ever more more than with most people, she had some feeling of something. But you know, she was just always she always made me feel very confident. You know, I never had I've never had a moment where I haven't felt totally confident in her. Mm. That's just how she makes me feel, and I think. So that that's obviously that's a that's a sign of greatness with anyone, isn't it? Like yeah. you 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 could always just tell that she she knows what she's doing, mm. and of course she's human, so it's not like she's always going to feel like she knows what she's doing. But but she had the, there's just this focus, and I think that that spirit of is sort of something that. That kind of strength of character, strong people with a strong spirit and that kind of strong vision, that's, I just like working with people like that. And it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be international superstars. It just means they're going to have some courage in their convictions and not be like, oh no, we better be doing this. What if we did look at, look at what the yeah. ne next guy's doing? Because that's just... It's just too boring. That yeah. and, and easy to do in 2018 for an artist who, who's maybe not, like you said, completely confident in in, in their own abilities, in, in the direction they want to go in. And there's so much going on. There's so much noise. It's easy to get thrown off course. Yeah, but I think it, it probably always has been, you know. Mm. It's probably only ever been like a certain amount of people in any field who've really got this confidence. It's all just confidence, mm. isn't it? It's the confidence to say, I'm doing this and... You know, it's never... And when people do well with things, it's never as easy as it looked, mm. you know? Things always have to start yeah. from people some People don't kind of... see the, the, the sometimes 5, 10, 15 years of hard work, the nose, the getting the door slammed, and then all of a sudden, things can kind of start lining up, and before you know it, you've, you've got a, a, a superstar. Of course. And, and, you know, there's also this idea of, like, six, like everyone, everyone wants to succeed, um... And I suppose like growing up listening to a lot of hip hop, in a way, hip hop celebrated success more than any other mm. music yeah. ever. Yeah. You know, like yeah. where it's really made a sort of point of that as part of the culture of it. And that makes total sense. But then at the same time, there is a danger in that. That if you get too caught up in that, that could get in the way of the the art. You get caught up in the source. You, well, see, it, you see it time and time again. Yeah. And, and that's really, really risky. You know, and so I think if you look at like, if you look at like the most, like even, so even if you look in, if you, in rap, if you look at like a Jay-Z, like the, who's probably as, as successful as anyone's been in that, actually, there's always been such a depth in the music, mm. do you know what I mean? And in the lyrics, yeah. much as he likes talking about being a businessman, there's this like amazing depth, like... A real depth. Of like artistry. Mm. Um, and I, I always hope like that's what people take when they look at him. Do you know what I mean? That's what they see. I, that's I, the, I that's, it, the, yeah. impor that's it, the important. It bit. definitely comes across, like you said, behind all the, the 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 <clears throat> the, the glitz and glamour, and like you said, he, he he's a businessman. There is real artistry, real creativity in his music, and that that's what I think has has kept Jay Z on top of his game more and, than anything. And so look at Adele. So then, if people are going to look at Adele and say, "Ah, oh, this many records sold," and but it's like what you want to look at is the naked honesty and emotion in the lyrics and in how she goes about things that it feels real and that she she's very real and not afraid to be her mm. and that's kind of what you hope for in an artist yeah yeah and so i think like when, when people like someone who's perceptive is going to look at her and see that and that maybe 
you know, I don't, I don't think it's always that easy to put that much of yourself out there, mm. you know, but a really good artist does that. Do you know, we haven't spoke about properly as yet we spoke about you know you getting into the the the, the studio uh real early your dj career of course the the, the, the whole movement with with founding and, and the success with excel but i want to talk about and bring it kind of up to date with what you're doing today because you're back in the studio the creativity is flowing like never before and you've put together an album that that is is very 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 good Tell us about how everything is recorded came about. Where, where was the thought process behind that? It's been a um, a kind of continuation of re like records I've been producing since 2010. I made a record with Gil Scott Heron called I'm New Here, um, which he was someone I wanted, really wanted to work with for my whole life. And um, we made an album together, which took quite a while to do, but came out, you know, very meaningful. How does it? How does it? How do you feel when, like you said, there's somebody who you've been you've wanted to work with your entire life, and then you get the opportunity to do it? Like, is there a? Are you then under like your own certain self pressure to deliver something that you've expected, or did it kind of just flow? You are under immense pressure. <laughs> immense, I, I imagine that's what it would be like. Immense pressure. I mean, there's just no getting around that. And I'd love to say, oh, you know, it was cool. I was, you know, was calm. I was relaxed about it. I mean, in the end, I was. But in a way, the big learning thing for me f from that was, like, there is no question that I was frightened mm. to do that. Like, there was something just about the whole thing that was like, because he was such a hero to me and an icon and he'd actually never made a bad album. He made like 13 albums in his life and they're all good. So it's not like he'd had a long period of making records that weren't good. Yeah. He'd had a period of not making records, yeah. <laughs> but he hadn't made bad records. Yeah. So I, th I felt immense pressure and on myself, but I just thought, oh man, I can't like end up making a record with Gil Scott Heron that's not good. Mm. So I did put immense pressure on myself about it and I did feel frightened, but... I don't know if you've ever heard this this um this saying, this idea that your fears are dragons guarding your deepest treasures. I like that I'm saying. I'm big on that. So I like that saying. It's like, well basically, I mean you, within you got, you within gotta slay those dragons. You've got to slay the dragons. Yeah. And actually within within reason and using a bit of common sense, whatever you're scared of, mm. that's what you need to be doing. Mm. That's like where the opportunity is, is like moving towards the thing that you're a bit like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that because I'll be a bit exposed, I might fail. Those are the, like yeah. those are the things. Yeah. I, I've found that in life definitely as well. That I like that saying. I like the way it's put though. It's a good one. So I think with him, it was like at that time, like I was, you know, I'd got back into um, just like making beats. Uh, first of all, on Reason on a laptop, and then Logic. So I was into that, and I was just doing that, kind of just doing that. And then the idea of working with Girl came up, and I was like, okay, so I'm going to be, you know, for those few years before that, I've been just running the label and I was like no I really wanted I can't ask someone else to do this it just doesn't it wouldn't have been genuine mm. of me to do that it would have been lazy to do that it was like this is something I want to I want to hear a new Gil Scott Heron record I want to collaborate with him I want to facilitate him to do it and I want to try and make sure it's really great however long that takes and however much work that takes so yeah I went off and did it and thankfully it was well received and then from there there was a sort of flow of other records that people asked me to make and also just projects I got involved in like doing these Africa Express things where we went to Ethiopia and we went to Kinshasa we made an album in Kinshasa that came out on the uh, Warp label and producing Damon Albarn's solo record and you know, then I'm doing records that actually aren't on Excel and that was interesting as well you know that's kind of interesting just because you're seeing th I'm seeing things purely from the kind of producer writer purely from the creative perspective. So that's interesting. And also this coincides with the label have been like, I built something over a long period of time and I've been very diligent about like finding amazing people. And it's not just artists, but people to be in the label, to staff the label, to run the label who were really like good at all the bits that need you need to be good at and better than I was. You know, because I always felt like, in, you know, I had some abilities for it, but at the same time, my my thinking is is artistic, and you can sometimes you can use that yeah. with the label, and sometimes it's hard, sometimes, to, it's yeah, hard yeah. to use that. So you've got to, you know, there's got to be a lot of common sense with those things. And I, I don't really have the most common sense. <laughs> um, so uh, 
that was you, you know it's like being a, a bit of a creative person you're a bit of a dreamer so it's, you've got to be like you've got to be able to bring that into the right thing so the label felt strong so I felt comfortable being in the studio um, I made a record with Bobby Womack I did Damon's record I made an album with an Afro-Cuban duo called Ibey who are um, sisters Afro-Cuban based in Paris we made we made an, uh, an album together um, which kind of caught on a bit around the world um, and during this time I'd built a studio and really great environment it's, a, it's in a house and but the house is the studio yeah so that's all and it's all the sacred place that's yeah. all that goes on yeah. there is creativity and that's it and I've I'd always needed that I've never had that before just a, a real creative space that dedicated isn't space. just mixed up with other stuff and comfortable where I've you know somewhere I could feel like I was at home but also other people could feel at home and that takes a bit of work how do you make a place where you feel at home but other people feel at home as well but I had this place and people were coming through for sessions and different people were knocking around and we did a lot of sort of improvised sessions, different musicians, different vocalists and gradually this kind of record started to emerge from it using some samples and there were different artists, some involved with the label, some not involved with the label, some people who like, so Sanford was involved from day one but this was way before Sanford had an album. Um, Gigs was around this pre-landlord it's a um, real diverse pool of artists who, who you, you've chosen to collaborate with. Just even not just on this album, but even the stuff that you was mentioning before, you know, traveling the world and working with, you know, Bobby Womack and, and work with Damon Albarn and, and, and Gil Scott Heron. This is a like a very vast, widely diverse pool of artists. Like you, you must have been getting so much out of just being able to really like spread your wings, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I've got a see, I'm not like for hire, as it were. Mm. Do, do you know what I mean? Mm. I don't mean that to mean I'm above that yeah. in any way. I mean more, I can't really work like that. It's got to be passion projects. It really is. Yeah. Labour's a love all yeah. the way. Yeah. And one of, the, one, one of the aspects of that is, like, I have to work with people who I feel are very, very honest, you know, in like what they put out yeah, there. Yeah. And they're, they're the people who, you know, I don't care if someone is commercial or not, but I do care if they're, if it's real, mm. you know. If they put something out there that is real and that you can believe, that's what I care about. Um, and then I kind of want to—I want to work with people who I like, who I really, who I love, mm. you know, and not just the voice, but the but the person. Yeah, yeah. So I think like with 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 that aspect, because a lot of people have asked me, so how did you come to choose the people on this record? And I had to think about that because there was no method. And then I realised something. That's like saying to a, like. Any of your listeners, any fan of music, how do you choose what you listen to as a music fan? Well, you don't. It happens. Yeah, it's just you like, listen it's, to what you love. Yeah, yeah. And actually, as a music fan, you can't be wrong. Your taste cannot it's be wrong. It's completely objective, isn't it? You can't like. It's what you're into. Yeah. So, and and like, what's the thread? So, if you're a music fan, what's the thread between the artists that you like? You've listened to this one today. You've listened to this. You know, you listen to this one. What's the, you know, you've listened to Rihanna, you've listened to Miles Davis, you've listened to Sneakbow, you've listened, you know, you've listened to the Beatles. What's the thread? You. You like it, yeah. You. <laughs> yeah. You're the thread. Yeah. And so when it, whatever you're listening to, it all connects yeah. via the listener. And the listener can't be wrong. So I think that was probably my approach to it, which I'd never really thought of before until I started doing things like this and had to explain the record. Yeah. Quite interesting in a way, yeah. you know, yeah. to having to explain it. It's interesting it to hear it explained like this as well because we speak to a lot of artists, a lot of... You know, producers, writers, and and I always try and find out their process of how they go about working on stuff, and just having that freedom, just to like you said, just to to be able to pick people you really want to work with, passion artists that you're passionate about, artists that you actually have a real relationship with. It makes for making the best music. I've always found. Yeah, I, and I think the you know music's about it's about relationships, isn't it? You know, and I know there is a way of making music where people are like more like brought in. This yeah. one's brought in. But you can one. you can always tell. You I feel tell. like you can tell, especially if you've been in the, in in the industry for for like the amount of time that we have. You, you can hear it straight away. You can hear when that that verse got emailed from LA to London. They never met. You can you can see the chemistry in the video. Sometimes it like it's evident when two artists have been in the studio. They've had come up with an idea together. They've they've worked on a a, a song from scratch. Yeah, it's a completely different deal altogether, I feel like. Yeah, and I'm into the process, you know, and that's that's important. Now, obviously, you've got, if you're like an artist starting out, you might think, well, 
what matters is the result and what you get and how that sounds and and that is important but the process of how you get to it is important as well and the process is happening regardless like the process is like your life mm. it's what you're doing yeah. day to day so it's like really I think that's really important and then you know you can almost look at the you can almost look at the result as like an accident that happens as a result of the, of the process mm. and the better the process is the better um, chance you've got yeah. If you're an artist, if you're someone who who makes music, if if you're aspiring to to be in the industry, there has been some absolute gems dropped in this tonight. I am just making it up as I go along. I don't, <laughs> don't anyone to think. If, I if this know is what I'm if this about. is a blag, this is like this is a great one. <laughs> I mean, there's no there's no training, is there? No. I mean, I'm not, I'm not I'm not actually qualified. Is yeah. anyone qualified? None I suppose of us you are. can train. You can train now, can't you? You can go and do a college course. I guess you can, but I've always felt that. The, the theory side of, of trying to get into this industry doesn't really work well when you're hit face first with the practical side of it. So I think learning on the job and getting experience is 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 way more valuable. I think Not to this or no, to discount no, no. any no, courses sure. out there, of course. Well, especially, I mean, I think I still think learning, like actually learning an instrument well is still a good one. Yeah. That's a good... You that's know, something I wish I, I had done, actually. That's a good... That's a really good thing to do just because I just think the, um, the discipline that takes. Mm. And also, it's still a bit invisible, but like there's still so much like great musicianship goes into the music we all hear. Mm. Probably a bit more than people can see. Yeah. Um, so I still think, you know, I like, I like the quick ways of making things and obviously electronic music and modern, you know, the modern I like, but I do think there's also like a nice thing if you can combine that with like serious musicianship mm. and everyone gets something from that as well. If you're working with vocalists and there's someone there who can really play, mm. that always just yeah. kind of... I, I feel like that's happening a, a lot more now. I feel like the, the UK especially has really raised its, its, like its production levels and, and, and yeah, the, 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 the music sounding better than ever well we did we did a couple of shows for everything is recorded and we had so you know gigs going through and sound for them but we also had like um some players from the sort of london kind of jazz so various so like you buy garcia came through and yes ahmed like so sax and trumpet players and they were amazing mm. and to have that combination that just adds a whole you know, new, especially live that incredible. just adds a, a whole different dynamic and there's a i mean and there's and london is like in the uk i mean it's like there's a powerful vibe at the moment really strong yeah. I think really strong in terms of like it's not just vocalists and producers it's just people who can really play I was going to actually well. ask you about that and ask mm. you about where we're at in, in 2018 and, and like you said London the UK is is really really strong at the moment is there anyone in particular that you know you've heard recently you've been like wow I'm, I'm kind of blown away by that or anyone you're kind of tipping for, for big things this year I mean I think it's like it is an incredible moment I mean, there hasn't been a moment like this before. I think the I think what a big turning point was the J Huss record, in all of it. Yeah. I just don't think there's been an album quite like that before. No, de no, definitely not. Like that was that was definitely like a one that kicked off the doors and opened up like the floodgates for for a bunch of artists to be able to to say, look, okay, this this could really work. Yeah, and I think him doing something which sounded to me like I felt like in the US. People have been managing to do that for decades, mm. like a record which was really street, but also really accessible. Mm. And that seemed like a code that was really hard yeah. to crack. It was like you have to choose which one are, yeah. you? are you. Are you like selling out and going commercial? Or are you going to be so underground that like you're probably not going to be heard by that many people? And that was, that was always a big frustration, I think, mm. for everyone here why that always happened, like why there wasn't a way of... So yeah, we always had our underground music here and this like incredibly rich sort of seam of everything we started talking about from rave through jungle through garage, but like could, it, could an artist really come through? And I suppose a lot of it was production based, not vocalist based, yeah, so yeah. that was tricky. But now we've hit a moment where it's like authentic music that people actually want to hear yeah. from artists who are the real deal and then the, you've also got someone, you know, like, so like a sample will be doing something totally different to what anyone is doing. Yeah. And there's room for that. Yeah. I wanted to ask you as well, you must have, or I, I say you must have, you, you've probably got plans to, to get back in the studio and, and, and continue working. Are we going to get another album real soon? Have you got other projects on the horizon? Do you have a wish list of artists that, that you want to get in with? I've just been, like I said, we did, a, we did these live shows, which were incredible in uh, uh, East London. Um, 
a couple of weeks ago. And that was really a vibe and great couple of nights. And then off the... I, I kind of have been thinking I wasn't going to even think about what was happening until I'd done these shows. We did these shows. And um, I just carried on recording, you know. And there's people, everyone's, people are about. So I've kind of just carried on... I'm sort of carrying on just doing this. Mm. Like this, everything is recorded has always felt like it wasn't intended as a record in the first place and then a, a record's come out of it. Yeah. Um, and it feels like quite an open-ended thing and also just a way of collaborating and a way of like being with people and collaborating with people and sort of seeing what happens and it being pretty open-ended in terms of musicians and vocalists. And and that's, a, you know, I, I'm realised I'm like really lucky to have that. It's very unusual. You know, it's very unusual to have a vehicle like that. So as much as possible, I do want to, um, I do want to keep rolling with that for the, for the time being. I mean, I never really have a wish list of people because in a way, my wish list of people to produce was Girl Scott Heron. That was, and I really went out of my way to make that happen and to kind of fulfill that. And since then, everything's happened mm. and evolved and has felt really natural. And I've kind of like just let myself go with it. So th th I guess the way you're working at the moment it is working for you. So, so you know, if it's not broken, why fix it? And I, yeah, I just think it's not, I, I wouldn't want to like say, oh, you know, there's that guy, like, and because I've heard that record, I kind of think if you let things happen, there's more of a sort of, I don't know, I, I like there being a bit of a looseness about it. Mm. And then you kind of just sort of see what, see what comes up. So I don't really have, I don't have a wish list. You know, we look forward to, to whatever it is you end up doing in the studio. For now, though, we can enjoy the album that you have graced us with. Richard Russell, it's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs>